Welcome to By Faith with Susie and Mike. This program is about regular people who've activated their faith and have done great things for the kingdom of God. When we move, God moves with us. What is God calling you to do today? By faith, obey his voice and enjoy the ride as he does things you could never imagine. Now here's your hosts, Susie and Mike. Welcome to another edition of By Faith with Susie and Mike. And you know, today uh, is a fun, fun day for us because we have a treat with us. We have uh, Stan Dobbs, and he is actually the president and founder of multiple uh, ministries. And we're going to be talking about that today, how he started them and how God worked through his heart and life. Uh, So uh, Stan, welcome to By Faith. Thank you, buddy. So Susie, how do you want to kick us off today? Well, I have a question. You are an apartment uh, complex. Uh, you develop a passion of serving apartment communities. How did you do that? And how did the Lord spoke to your heart to start that? Oh, wow. Well, I, uh, I was a late bloomer uh, to Christ. I came to know Jesus in my early 20s and uh, moved the family to seminary in Fort Worth and went on staff at a church in the mid-cities that had a ministry to low-income apartments that they had started in the 80s. And I had never seen anything like it. I had never seen what ministry in apartments looks like. And I just fell in love with it. It was so raw. It was authentic. It was outside the walls of the church. And I just became passionate about ministry and apartments. And that's, that's where that started, uh, uh, through a local church in the mid-cities. <clears throat> so Stan, you, you talked about your childhood and that you were a late bloomer, which will be interesting in a little bit when we talk about how uh, God put it in your heart to start Lion's Heart Children's, Children's Academy. But let's talk about your faith journey. Okay. Um, a late bloomer in the 20s. You know, I drifted. I grew up in a Christian family mm-hmm. and I was a true prodigal who drifted and then God rescued me, brought me back. Tell me about your, your journey. Well, my family was not uh, super spiritual and, and really didn't expose us to spiritual things uh, with any real intentionality. And so I kind of wallowed in the pig pen for the early years of my life uh, through college and uh, it was really through my wife uh, that I really began to explore in earnest uh, spiritual things in my early 20s. And she basically let it be known that if we were going to stay together, uh, I was going to be going to church with her. <laughs> and so <laughs> she, uh, uh, I started attending a church in Houston, uh, Willcrest Baptist Church. And uh, just sitting under the influence of the gospel and, and good teaching, I walked the aisle to just as I am as a, uh, in, in uh, probably 23, 24 years old and uh, haven't looked back. So uh, it's you and your, and your wife, were, both of you were believers when you started uh, your ministry? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I uh, came to know the Lord in my mid-20s. I went through a, a program that was very influential for me spiritually called Evangelism Explosion that yeah, you taught too. you how to share your faith. <laughs> that's, and, that's uh, and then went through uh, Henry Blackaby's Experiencing yes, God, sir. which that's formed what, yeah. so many of us <laughs> yeah. at, at our yeah. age. Yeah. And, and it was literally Henry Blackaby came to our church one weekend and did an Experiencing God weekend and that was the weekend that i uh, felt this very deep call to to ministry and to leave i was in the computer industry at the time and so i walked in the office on monday morning and turned in my resignation and within 30 days i was in seminary in fort worth so it was one of those radical uh, right turns in life well, <laughs> <laughs> well that was incredible because what we want to talk about next is how that turn right here you are your salesman you're working in the computer industry mm-hmm. and the, the wife you're talking about there is the beautiful Vicky. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I'll tell you, uh, at that moment, you, tar- you started to take these steps towards God. Um, what did God do in your heart to really the word called? You got called to ministry. Mm. Talk to me about what a calling is is wow it's well it's mysterious and and it's hard to you know i don't think it's necessarily definitive for each person but i'll never forget sitting there at that conference so henry blackaby and i'd already had this stirring that maybe i wasn't on the path of life that god wanted me on although the computer industry was wonderful but i just it was just this deep sense that uh god wanted something different from my life and i don't know 
how to put it in any other terms, but I remember for sure sitting in that conference that weekend in the church, listening to Henry Blackaby, and it just was this deep sense of conviction that, you know, step out on faith and follow. And I didn't even know what that meant or where it was going to take me, but it was really clear that he wanted me to, to do something different. And so that was kind of that first step of faith to say, okay, God, I'll follow without really knowing exactly where this ship is going. <laughs> you went on what we call the God ride, right, Susan? Yeah. You, you've, ride. Been, so, you've been on the God ride. The God ride. Absolutely. Yeah. So by faith, you followed Christ uh, going to seminary. So after seminary, what did you do immediately? How did you put into action ah, the, hmm. what you have learned in the seminary? Ah, well, things got really interesting because I had been in seminary only about six months and I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, hmm. which they told me was incurable hmm. and that I had about 10 years to live. That was the, the average. And, and what old, year was how this? How old were you now? This was uh, in 1995. Okay. So we had just gotten to seminary. So I had literally just arrived. And so that was a definite blow from left field, right? Well, God, I just stepped out on faith and followed you and resigned my job and moved to seminary. And now this. And but it's so funny, Susie, that, that I call it my divine diagnosis because God used it. At that time, we thought we were going overseas as missionaries, but that door was shut. And that led directly to my exposure to ministry and apartments and directly to the birth of apartment life. So we call that my divine diagnosis because God used that to redirect the ministry and, and lead me to what, what became apartment yeah. life. And for those of you who don't know what apartment life is, uh, first off, take a look at this map. We're gonna put this map up here. When Stan Dobbs became the president and founder of apartment life, he discovered that there was a real need, right, in the apartment industry. Uh, you call it business tree, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and what he saw here is that uh, if people had a sense of community, if they had friends where they lived, they would stay there longer. And you really saw the connection between the local church and the apartment industry. Talk about this because this is an incredible thing. There was a real value proposition on the business side, mm -hmm. but there was an incredible uh, opportunity for evangelism mm -hmm. on the ministry side. When, when did God show you that? It, uh, it was in the early days of my uh, uh, encounter with apartment ministry through the local church. At that time, it was First Baptist Church of Euless. Now it's called Cross City. But the, the, the big idea, most people don't realize how strategic the apartment industry is for the future of the gospel for the sheer fact that about half the population of our major cities live in some form of apartments, multifamily housing, but yet the gospel's penetration in apartments is a fraction of what it is in single family homeowner neighborhoods. And when I would talk to pastors who were surrounded by apartments and say, what is your strategy for reaching apartments? It was just like, never really even thought about it. You know, no strategy, the body of Christ in general had no strategy to, to reach in a sustained way apartments. Uh, on the business side, we saw that apartment owners likewise really didn't have a strong strategy for this building community. They knew how to operate the apartments. They knew how to plant the flowers and fix the toilets and collect the rent. They knew how to operate them well. But when you start talking about how do you meet the deeper needs of your residents to anchor them in community, to connect them to one another, to really put down roots, Again, just, you know, not on the radar. So the big idea was, could we provide a service to apartment owners that would help them make more money? But the byproduct was it would allow us to plant Christians into these apartments in a very strategic way to become the, the relational center of the community. And that would uh, give these couples, usually they were married couples, give them a really privileged position to reach uh, their neighborhood, their their apartment community for Christ. So it's a kind of, we call it a business tree. It's a ministry uh, wrapped in a business shell. And so the apartment owners pay us. Uh, it's a unique nonprofit in that the majority of our budget is covered by business revenue because the apartment owners pay us because we're making them more money. But then spiritually, uh, they're allowing us to plant Christians in very strategic positions. Great. Great so model. You founded this uh, in 2000? 2000. 2000. Is, so 21 years ago. So yeah. how many uh, states are you in now? And uh, how many teams 
Is that there put, the, are, put the map up again, guys, if you don't mind. Yeah, it, it has just exploded. There are well over a thousand Christians living in apartments across the country and other countries now, uh, living out uh, the, a very intentional life for Jesus in their neighborhood. Uh, but even now, today, 20 years later, we're still just scratching the surface of the opportunity. Here in Dallas, probably. Uh, uh, several hundred uh, Christians living in apartments, but again, probably have you know 10% of the market at this point. So a whole lot of uh, additional upside opportunity yeah. for the gospel. You know, let's take a look at this graph here. This shows you that apartment. If you are an owner of an apartment uh, complex, right? Take a look at this graphic. A sense of community was the second most important factor for renewals. Stan, number one, why are renewals so important? Uh, if you could lower the turnover cost, right, and you're a business, if you own an apartment uh, complex, what does that do to help their bottom line? Yeah, the average turnover in an apartment might be 75% per year. So think about that. Every year they're losing 75% of their customers and having to replace it. So very expensive to the operation of the business. We, we, we say if we can lower that by five to 10 percentage points, which we've proven that we can, you know, that might be a $250,000 a year in direct value to the apartment community. So by the body of Christ meeting this need in a, in a creative way, and again, allowing us to, to put Christ followers in these communities with intentionality. You know, they get a list of people on Monday morning. Here's the 10 people that moved in. Your job is to go to the door and be the first one to welcome them to the community or, or to, to do a pancake breakfast to bring them down to meet their neighbors or to minister to them when their life blows up. I mean, you're putting these couples in a, any missionary would kill for the kind of access that, that these teams have in their community. But it's all driven because we're meeting a real legitimate business need. Yeah. So it's a very interesting kind of a business tree model. Yeah. Uh, so what do they do uh, if your uh, team will be there? What are the first things that they do? Do, do they um, survey or knock in the doors of how, how, do, how does that work? Do they have a Bible study or anything spiritually that will help? M the, many the times they do. We, we, we see it as always in vital connection with the local church. So these couples mm -hmm. are sent out from a church within the, the neighboring community. So they're there as ambassadors for Christ, but also ambassadors for that local mm -hmm. church. So they're constantly seeking people who have spiritual interest and inviting them to the church so that they can become fully mature disciples. But if you think about what they do, Susie, put it in three buckets. Mm -hmm. So they do welcome. Mm -hmm. So that when new people move in, they welcome the community. Yes. They plan all the social functions that go on, all the parties. So they're the party people. Uh, and then they're also like the chaplain. Think of that. So inevitably somebody's life blows up in the community and they know the first person they can call is the apartment life team. So that'd be a good way to kind of think about the three main functions that they have. What an amazing service that is. If I am in that apartment, I would love to be a part Absolutely. of apartment life. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and for those of us in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you know, churches like Gateway and Prestonwood and uh, you name it, uh, they use this incredible First Baptist Dallas, your church, uh, Susie, in the past, have used this great strategy to go and reach people. Uh, and Stan, I will tell you, you know, I got uh, I got to see it and it's such a powerful ministry. It's unique. Here you're going. You start this in 2000. It's growing. You get to around 2011. Right. And um, and in the health scare or the health thing that you knew about early on mm -hmm. really comes to full circle. Right. Yeah, yeah. Tell us what happened in 2011. Well, I had to fight the cancer off and on for a, about. 15 years and it, 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 it got really serious in 2011. I was running out of bullets and the last silver bullet was, uh, and it wasn't available at the time of my diagnosis, but to have a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplant. So I moved offline in 2011 and basically spent about a year at MD Anderson going through a, a stem cell transplant, which is an aside, the most powerful physical picture of our spiritual reality in Jesus in that a donor, a young man <laughs> who was, was at Clemson University, gave his blood, his special blood, and I ingested his blood, and his blood grafted over my immune system and basically replaced my immune system with his and uh, gave me new life. 
I was going to die if he didn't give me his blood. And it's a perfect picture of what Jesus' blood has done for us. It, it grafts over our sinful nature and gives us a new nature in his blood. And so that's what happened to me. So praise God uh, that he was willing to do that. But it was during that time that I picked up a book. I don't even know who gave it to me by George Barna called uh, Transforming Children into Spiritual Champions. And I'm reading this and I came across the punchline of the book that just knocked me off my feet. And he says, if we have not reached a person for Christ by their 13th birthday, the chances are slim that we ever will. And he, he basically, this was the culmination of all of his data and research that we have uh, 12 years, statistically speaking, to reach people for Christ. And then our, our chance of doing so just falls off the cliff. And so that captivated me and, and really began a whole new ministry journey for me, which is how do we help the body of Christ reach a lot more children during their earliest years? And that really directly led to, it's almost the second divine diagnosis where God used cancer as a catalyst to launch uh, a, a new vision in what became Lionheart Children's Academy and then later Skylark Camps mm. of really being very pragmatic, still with that business tree model, of how do we reach more children during uh, their very earliest years. <clears throat> so uh, with regards to also with uh, going back to apartment life, uh, you develop an incredible culture in that and oh, yeah, you won. An incredible culture. The best Christian won. workplace. How many years in a row, Stan? It's been 20 years now. Okay. <clears throat> and I could speak. I've seen this culture. It really is a unique it's a fun, by the way, God once woke me up and he said, describe me in one word. You know this, Susie. Well, one of the words that I uh, described God with was fun. You know, he's a fun God. And the culture that you created, even though we're doing ministry, it's fun. It, but it's not, it's not that it's not hard. It is hard, but it's fun. Yeah. For someone out there and people who are running ministries, how do you make ministry fun, Stan? <laughs> <laughs> how do you make ministry fun? Well, I think you create a culture where you give people permission to have fun, right? Mm -hmm. And and you create an environment where fun is celebrated. And I tell people in our ministry, have fun or go home. Have fun or find something <laughs> else to do, you know? So uh, it's, it's hard to say. You know, there were so many others, Mike, as you know, that came along that helped create that culture. But uh, I think as leaders, we just have to give people permission and create an environment where mm -hmm. You know, what we're, what we're doing is deadly serious, right? Yeah. It's eternal significant, but Jesus had a lot of fun, right? And so it's all about modeling the master. <clears throat> yeah. Hey, let's go, let's go back to the graph. Let's go back to the graphic where it shows um, the stats about reaching kids at a young age. Can you put that up? Okay, so let's look at this. Stan, you touched upon it. So when you were really facing that health challenge in 2011, God puts this on your heart to start the Lionheart Children's Academy. What I want to talk about right now is um, by faith, right? This program's about moving, activation of faith. You heard, you believe it's from God. Talk about how you actually put it into a, a practical strategy where you started Lion's Heart, which is an amazing thing. You have another ministry going, you're coming off an illness. How do you do that? And what would be your advice out there to people who God's tugging on their heart to do mm -hmm. something and there's every excuse in the world, right? Mm. Not to do it. Not the right time. We don't mm. have the money. We don't. But And Susie, you know all about this because you did the same thing. How do you activate your faith when, you're, when it's against, from a human perspective, it seems impossible. How do you do that? Mm. I mean, my experience has been that if, if God gives a vision, then he follows it up very quickly with putting other people in your life that can resource that vision, can add the pieces to the puzzle. Uh, and I'm sure you've had the same, Susie. It's like, if it's of the Lord, he's going to make it happen. And it's not like you've got to go figure out how smart you are to go, you know, make it all happen. And, and like, if you take apartment life as an example, you know, he, he started putting people in my life that were already embedded in the apartment industry that loved Jesus, that wanted to make a difference. And, and so when we kind of gave them a track to run on, they were like, okay, I'm all about it. So it was really just about uh, being faithful and uh, keeping your eyes open to the people that God is putting in your path. And, uh, all three of the ministries that I've been involved in, that's kind of how it happened. It wasn't like this heavy drudgery of going, trying to make things happen. It was like, 
just stand back and you know, <laughs> watch what he's doing. So. so in every test, there is a testimony. And when God gives a vision, there's provision. Yeah. So could you there give you us go. a story, a one story of how God provided in an incredible way, like um, a miracle? Oh, my God. I know you got a lot, probably. So give us one. I'll give you one. When we were launching Lionheart, uh, we had an early uh, season where things were difficult and it wasn't working out uh, the way I had hoped. And we were having some operational challenges. Money was running dry. And I wanted to go... Shoot. Jim Beckett. Mm -hmm. Jim Beckett mm -hmm. invited me to a, a, a dinner at his house and I didn't want to go. And it was basically people who had been through uh, in ministry that had been through some type of health crisis. Mm -hmm. So I went and sit across the table was Tommy Miller, who used to run Interstate Batteries. He's Norm Miller's brother. Mm -hmm. And I just made a few little comments about what we were doing with Lionheart and God moved in his spirit. He called me afterwards and uh, we went out to lunch and he made an immediate, just on the spot. I, we hadn't known each other five minutes and he made a significant investment in Lionheart and then introduced us to Norm. And now they have come along and just been an incredible supporter. And it was just a random, you know, at a time when God knew I needed, I needed a lift. You know, and that that's just one of many, many examples of where just the provision is there. So it's really a fun, a fun thing to just have faith in God wherein you don't really know what's going to happen next. So uh, if God calls you to some incredible task, if he tells you to jump, you just go ahead and jump because two things he would do. <laughs> he would either catch you. Or teach you how to fly. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> he's done both, right, Stan? He's caught you at times, and he's caught you how to fly at times. Yes. Yeah. You know, and one thing that Stan said, and it's true, if God is calling you right now to activate your faith and do something for the kingdom of God, you know, God's got people everywhere. And he's got limited, limitless resources. You just got to make sure that it's his plan and not your own plan, right? That's the hard part. So let me, let's, let's look at this picture of the lion heart bus and, um, you know, Bent Tree. Look let's, at you. Look you at that. Yeah. <laughs> and let's go to Bent Tree Bible. Uh, there, that is one of the places we they're at. We just opened yeah. there. Yeah. So you guys, man, this thing has taken off. So t when you think about giving your children uh, to a place that's faith-based and you know they're going to hear about Jesus, mm. what's the alternative? Like the kinder cares, the other places, um, your kids are there all day mm -hmm. and they're not going to be hearing about faith, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Well, that the, the sad truth. So go back to the gospel shot clock, the, the uh, George Barnes statistics. We've called that the gospel shot clock. And it starts when you're born and the buzzer goes off on your 13th birthday. And that's the window that we have maximum leverage to influence spiritual formation and evangelism in people in their entire life. So uh, when you start thinking about the practical ways to do that, the realities in our culture today, most families in America are either single parent household or dual income. Mom and dad are both working full time. And so the experience of children during the gospel shot clock is they're in some form of childcare starting at six weeks old when they're born all the way through preschool. And then they go in the public school system and the parents are looking at an after school program to take care of them until they get off work. And then they're looking for something all summer to take care of them, right? When you look at those three businesses, the preschool, after school, and summer, it's dominated by secular companies today. The body of Christ is a small, very small part of the whole picture. We just felt like that was not smart for the future of the gospel. So we got to figure out how do we empower the body of Christ to kind of take back the child care industry because then we can get those children out of secular child care under the influence of the gospel during these very critical years, right? But you can't ask the church to become a world-class operator of child care. It's a very complicated business, operationally very intense. So the idea of Lionheart is let's go build an operating system, a platform, systems, basically a brand that churches can just snap in and leverage that without having to reinvent it. But So Lionheart operates always in a local church in a very tightly integrated spiritual partnership. So we get these kids out of secular child care onto the campus of the church every day serve them well, love them well, share the gospel with them, and then figure out how do we get them plugged into the church. And so that's the big idea of Lionheart. We just opened Bentry as our 13th location. Wow. 
and they are lined up. I mean, this thing is proving to be a very, it makes money too. Yeah. So we bless the church financially. We bless the church spiritually by bringing in a lot of lost families. Oh and, yeah, hold and on And then operationally, we, we do the heavy lifting. So Susie, you had a great question before about getting the parents. So you can get the parents through the kids. You've seen that. Mm -hmm. Ask Stan what we were talking about before the program today about that. Well, um, in my church, uh, First Baptist with Dr. Chris Will, mm -hmm. Uh, I have been there now for 38 years, but uh, in the beginning, I was uh, made aware that the ministry of the church really uh, is reaching the children first, because if the children would come, the parents would have to take the children. So it's a double... Like McDonald's. Uh, yes, so it's a double... Uh, uh, um, yes. Blessing. Blessings and yes, amazing yeah. things for the church. So it's really all about children. That's what Operation Care does. Uh, internationally, God gave a uh, vision for me to reach out the children because they're the ones that's vulnerable and they're mm -hmm. the ones that needed help and they're the ones that future generation. So that's uh, Operation Care helped the children all over the world. Awesome. We are now in 46 countries awesome. last December. Mm -hmm. And so with your ministry reaching out to the children, uh, what is Skylark? Uh, Skylark is part yeah your other uh, ministry. So yes. tell us about Skylark and how, how is it distinctive from other summer camps? Yes. So Skylark is the baby. It's uh, still in kind of proof of concept. We've done two summers now. But if you think about traditional Christian camping like Pine Cove, Young Life, mm -hmm. Canacuck, Sky Ranch, right? Lots of incredible ministries. Uh, very proven to be very spiritually powerful, but have some real uh, glaring uh, uh, opportunities that they aren't addressing. Most camps tend to be remote, geographically, uh, expensive, uh, and, and most concerning to me was they typically only uh, serve people for one week. So you go to camp for one week. You go to vacation Bible mm -hmm. school for one week. What are those kids doing the other 10 or 11 weeks during the summer? Well, most of them are going to some secular uh, program. So we said, what if we took the excellence, which is Pineco in our world, I grew up, love Pineco. Uh, what if we took that concept, remodeled it, repackaged it, brought it into the city, embedded it into a local church and delivered it all summer. So we had those kids for 12 weeks rather than one week. That's the big idea. Uh, and then you can have a much deeper impact on the children and on their parents because they're coming to you all summer long. So we've hired a bunch of mostly ex Pine Cove leaders that have basically uh, taken this vision. We did our first camp in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic at Hillcrest Baptist Church in Cedar Hill. Mm. We added two more churches this summer at Irving Bible Church in Cottonwood Creek. Cottonwood Creek. So and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. this thing is just, it's going to explode because most campuses, most church campuses in the summer are relatively low energy. Yeah. You know, there's just not a lot going on. We just infuse uh, energy and lots and lots of kids coming all summer and just gives us an incredible platform to, to reach more families. That's Skylark. Mm -hmm. Wow. It so, seems like God has downloaded so many ideas in your <laughs> brain and it's all happening. So we pray that God will download more so more will be blessed. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm not sure how many more laps around the track. Today. You know, these things take a pound of flesh out of you. You yeah. know full well. Yeah. Right. Wait, it's hey, <laughs> wait, now that you reflect back, though, Stan, I know you took a trip. Uh, I was following you on Facebook, and I got to see you and your, your wife went all over uh, the U.S., saw a lot of fun places. When you reflect back personally on what God has done, when you first took that first step of faith uh, into ministry and you got called, and now you can see what God has done. Um, what would you, what would you say about this this journey at this stage that you're at right now about God? I think you said it earlier. It's just fun. I mean, God has just he's got such a sense of humor. He, he takes you on these craziest rides that you would have never in your wildest <laughs> yeah. dreams. Yeah. And you look back and you just, this has not been work. I tell people I had worked a day in my life because you love what you That's do. True. You would show up and yeah. you do it. I it's love, not a, yes. never about money. That's yeah. It's about just loving God and following his footsteps. And so I, I just feel incredibly grateful to have been able to be a part, you yeah. know, and to see that these things will grow. One of the things you, that I've learned is that uh, I'm needing to get out of these ministries because uh, as they get bigger, 
you, you, you get out of your gifting. Mm. And you need to bring in other leaders like yes. Pete Kelly yes. that are wired to take organizations from here to here. Yep. You might be wired to take them from here to here. And, and I realized in apartment life, I, I stayed too long. I stayed out of my gifting. And so I'm not wanting to make that same mistake. So we're now actually looking for a new CEO to come in because we see the scalability potential of both these ministries, but it's going to require a different kind of leader. That's just, that's not life-giving to me. Yeah. You know? yeah. I want to go think up another one and, and spin another one up. So you learn over, yeah. you know, unfortunately, it, sometimes it takes you too long. <laughs> you, you know, all these ministries are scalable and they are repli you could replicate them. They're all over the country. So if you're watching today and you're saying, hey, wow, these sound pretty neat. Get in touch with Stan. Hey, if it's a apartmentlife.org or go to Lion's Heart or you could reach out uh, to Stan. Hey, we're out of time. We've covered so much today. We always ask our guests, right? Describe Jesus in one word. Mm. Yeah. And, and uh, we get a lot of fun, great answers here. But if you had to describe them in one word, what's the word mm. and why? Mm. My love. I mean, the the reason that my heart beats. Mm. <laughs> that's two words. <laughs> well, that that's anybody that's met him feels it. the same way about him. Yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. If you meet him, you love him. Oh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And if you've never met him before, and you're just flipping through, or you're watching today, uh, we want to invite you to meet him right here, right now. And how do you do that? Well, I'll tell you how you do that. It says in the Bible that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter what you're in. It doesn't matter what's going on. If you're hearing this today and you call upon his name, you can be saved. There are no man-made limits to God's grace. It's mm. all grace. So, Susie, yeah, I love your ABCs. Keep it simple. Yes. Simple things. A, B, C. A, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. B, believe that he is the only way. C, confess that you are a sinner. So I would like to lead you in that prayer. Mm. Okay, shall we pray? Mm. <laughs> Lord Jesus, mm. I accept you in my heart as my Lord and Savior. I pray you forgive me from all my sins. I pray you help me to be the child of God that you want me to be. In your name, amen. 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 Thank, you, Thank you, Stan. We'll have to have you Thank back you again, Stan. and we'll see you next time on By Faith.